Okay, folks, our next uh, speaker I'm not going to give much of an introduction to. All I want to say is he became a very dear friend of mine, a man I have a tremendous amount of respect uh, as far as I'm concerned. He is a, a true living American hero who will be written about for decades and decades uh, in history books, if not longer. And uh, he has a story to tell. I asked him to talk about his own story of battling the federal government because uh, it really is eye-opening as to what's really going on with our public service and government, the federal government, or what needs to be done to change things, to straighten things out. So please help me give a warm hand of welcome to Congressman James Trafficking. I gotta give it to you after. I don't know. I don't know what you're so glad about. The FBI and IRS is out writing down your license plate numbers. Hey, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be anywhere. We've just heard a bunch of speakers. They get better every time. I keep saying that uh, Larry's not here, B-Craft, but everybody should hear him. There he is in the back. Everybody in Congress should hear you. And Big Dan, you could sell anything. But that gold looks good. And where's Russell Tice? You better get in here because they're going to pick him up before long. I remember a speech I made in the House floor. They were debating the CIA budget. And I said, you know, we learned about the invasion of Kuwait on CNN. We learned about the collapse of the Berlin Wall on CNN. We learned about the implosion of the Soviet Union on CNN. Why fund the CIA? Hire the CNN. It made national news. CNN used it as a TV ad for months. Congress made them take them out. And they did whole one-page one uh, ads out in Los Angeles. But the point I'm making is that a lot of those agencies aren't that damn good. And we've known for a long time they've been spying on us. We've got a problem. And the amazing thing about it is it crushes me at this time of my life. As I honestly got to believe I was somebody that could have made a significant difference. When I ran for Congress, I wasn't endorsed by any party. Not one newspaper, no labor unions, nothing. And they had one of the biggest votes in all of Congress. How did they do it? I'm going to answer those questions after it's over. Just because you're the boss don't mean you could interrupt. <laughs> That's right. But anyway, let me tell you a little about myself. Because you're going to read about me in the history books. All you have to do is go to the law library. I get indicted every 10 years. Get convicted intermittently. I have a unique distinction of being the only American in the United States history to defeat the United States Justice Department in a RICO trial, full jury verdict, pro se, without being an attorney. I'm so proud of that. <laughs> After it was over, the judge stated that come back to me. She told some people that he was born an attorney. She said, but he made the three FBI agents look like Larry, Moe, and Curly when he got them on the stand. And that was the truth. But the bad part of that was I had a bullseye on my back. Then I run for Congress. All you could read in the papers about me was, you know, you can't have this guy. You don't want this guy. And people elected me overwhelmingly. I went to Congress and I passed some of the significant legislation 
that affect you in your life right now and you're not familiar with. Prior to 1998 tax reform law, you went to civil trial in the tax court and 95 percent of tax trials were civil court. You were guilty and had to prove your innocence. I won in 1985. One of the very first bills I submitted was when the IRS litigates in a civil trial, the burden of proof transfers from the taxpayer to the Internal Revenue Service. They should be able to maintain, through litigation, their accusation for cause. I almost got in a fist fight with Dan Rosinkowski. And I was a Democrat. Democrats targeted me too. Because I said for 50 years you controlled this place and you've written every one of these laws. Then on election day you turn the people against each other. Rich against poor, black against white. Separate politics of division. And then after it's over you go in that back room and give those tax breaks for the rich. So Democrats, you can't have it both ways. They didn't like that coming from the son of a truck driver. Democrat with a target on his back. Rosinkowski wouldn't hold a hearing. Later on in my career down there, powerful members from Ohio and Pennsylvania wanted to put me on the Ways and Means Committee, Taxes and Trade. He felt I was the guy. Rosinkowski told Chairman Jack Murtha, who was head of the delegation, I'll never take drive again. I can't have him. So there's an old football player from the University of Pittsburgh. I played football with Mike Ditka. You may know Mike on the NFL games, ESPN. So Mike's from Chicago, played ball in Chicago. I called Mike. I said, call Rosinkowski, see what you could do. He called me back. He said, man, he's adamant. He didn't want to hear nothing about you. So they go to talk with Rosinkowski again, and he gave me the greatest compliment I ever had. He says, I can't take trafficking. I'll never pass another free trade agreement. I'll never pass another tax increase. And Murtha says, what are you talking about, Dan? You got 45 members. He said, trafficking is not normal. <laughs> he said, he'll have senior citizens picketing my damn Chicago office. That guy gets the country excited, and I don't need it. He was right. There had been no more NAFTA, SHAFTA, GATA, none of it. We're in trouble. But now back to that bill. Dan Rosinkowski and I almost had a damn fight over it. The Republicans come into office, and the first thing they did is they were going to reform the Internal Revenue Service. Let me just say this about the word reform. There's no such thing as reform. That never happens. They change a few numbers. I think Larry educated everybody. I don't have to spend any time on it. But here we go. Bill Archer, the new chairman of Ways and Means from Texas, and I believe if young Bush would have made him his secretary of the Treasury, you would have implemented the law that I believe I could have passed, that I'm going to talk to you about today, that I think should be the freedom movement in America. This is no longer a tax problem. This is a problem of freedom, and we're going to discuss it. But Archer called me and said, Jim, I want to put your burden of proof in this comprehensive reform. He said, but the IRS said they'll recommend a veto to Clinton if it has the trafficking provisions. I said, hell, Chairman. Let him veto it. Why don't we stand up? What is this? Government by executive order? He said, listen, I'll come back to it next year 
will try and take it up on its own, and that's passing the buck. You know nothing's going to happen. So it came to the floor. I said on the House floor, I'm going to vote for this thing. It's a feel-good bill. It's not going to do anything. I got a call that night about 8 o'clock. He was Chairman Archer. He said, Jim, you know, we have the House bill. The Senate has their bill, and we're going to conference now on the differences. He said, but I want to tell you something. He said, I've never experienced anything like it in my political life. See, we've been inundated with phone calls and messages around the country. They want the traffic and burden of proof bill in that reform. I was humbled. And here's what this little chairman from Texas, Bill Archer, American hero, here's what he said. I'm going to put it in in conference. Folks, one of the few times in the history of the United States, Congress, a significant piece of legislation not discussed nor a part of either of the House or Senate bill was placed into the bill and then brought back to each respective body for a vote. Now here's what the trafficking law said. The IRS comes out to audit you. The taxpayer can't tell them to go to hell. They have a responsibility to justify the claim they filed. Now, I don't want to get into all the technicalities about ratified and the truth and the legality. Because when you get to court, like Larry said, those gurus aren't going to be with you. But I said, if that taxpayer does not tell them to go to hell, provides them with the information relative to their return, and the IRS is not satisfied and chooses to litigate. As soon as they litigate, that burden of proof transfers from the back of the taxpayer to the back of the Internal Revenue Service. Second of all, it says no more coming around and just grabbing properties. They must give you notice and you must have the right to contest their taking. He put it in the bill. Come back to both bodies. Both bodies passed it. Conference report, now the bill goes to President Clinton. Robert Novak, the esteemed conservative TV host. And he liked me. He didn't like anybody. I'm on his show and he says, Jim, he says, listen, I'm with you 100%. He said, but let's tell like it is. He says that. The IRS has recommended a veto to Clinton. I said, I know. I said, I'm going to be doing a debate with the director of the commissioner of the IRS through the Wall Street Journal here. And I'm hoping that uh, Clinton will read it. He said, what do you think our chances are? And this is exactly what I said on national TV. I said, they don't call Bill Clinton Slick Willie for nothing. He could veto the bill and help those IRS workers, or he could sign that bill and help the American people. Now they have the debate. Me and the IRS commissioner, an acting commissioner, a woman. I don't remember her name. Her name wasn't important to me. She says, if you have this trafficking provision, deadbeats are going to get over. We're going to have to have strict enforcement. I said, give me an example. And here's the example she cited. I want you to imagine a person says they give $1,000 a week to the church. We have to do a net worth. We've got to go to their neighborhood. We've got to look at their lifestyle there. I said, why don't you ask for a receipt and go to church? And she said, let's tell it like it is. She said, Mr. Trafficking, how can the Internal Revenue Service prove a negative? I said, beam me up. I said, how can a taxpayer prove the negative? You're accusing. You must have ample cause to point your finger at that taxpayer with all the power of the federal government leaning on them. And if you don't have enough to carry it in court, get your damn finger off them.
conference report the bill goes to President Clinton. He signed the bill. I was the only Democrat invited to the press conference of that Republican bill. Because I was an unusual member. I didn't care whose legislation it was. If it was good for the country, I didn't care if it was Democrat or Republican. I was going to vote for it. It's the way it was. And guess what happens, folks? They do an analysis of this reform law, Larry. And they take a 12-month snapshot when the burden of proof is on the taxpayer and a 12-month snapshot after the enactment of the bill when the burden of proof transferred to the Internal Revenue Service. Three major categories impacted. Number one, wage garnishments. When the taxpayer had the burden of proof, 3.1 million Americans had their wages garnished. When that burden of proof transferred to the Internal Revenue Service, 560,000. Three million less. Second category, property liens. Taxpayer with the burden, 677,000. IRS with the burden, 161,000. And you know, when your property is lean, you're a businessman, you're done. But the big one was individual family owned homes, seized by the Internal Revenue Service. When taxpayer had the burden, 10,073. With the burden on the IRS, 57 homes. Wow. Wow. The biggest file at NSA, CIA, FBI, and IRS got my name on it. I was getting to be dangerous. When something happened in the country, I got the information. Russell didn't get in here, but if you want to hear about an amazing thing, I'm the congressman that took on the Demonia case, who was convicted of being Ivan the Terrible of Treblinka. Cleveland auto worker, his members wouldn't talk to him, senators wouldn't talk to him, been to everybody's, and the whole place was too sensitive. So they come in to me and they said, we didn't want to come to Jim. We know the government hates him. Well, the newspapers the next day said, trafficking supports a Nazi mass murderer. How's that for PR? They didn't put Bob in there that when the family come in, they said, don't take him. If you sit with this family, your career's over. And I heard the boys say, I never had a parking ticket. I just want to meet with somebody in office. I'm a citizen. I said, send them in. They didn't put this in the paper. I said, if your father is guilty of any heinous crime, uh, any heinous crime involving any of this business, I could pull the switch. But I believe your gutless congressmen and senators should have sat down with you and your family and given you the courtesy. They said, Jim, please look into this. My father's not Ivan. What saved his life was that headline, Travagant Supports Nazi Mass Murder. Because people in the government said, here's somebody that will do something with it. Next thing you know, bang, I get a couple forms, originals. This key witness, Otto Horn, that supposedly worked on the line with Ivan, who testified that it was Demonyuk. Well, two years before they took Demonyuk to take his citizenship away, they interviewed him in Berlin, and they showed him photographs, and he couldn't identify them. But when he went to trial, he said he identified him as Ivan, so I knew they were lying. So I ran a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act investigation. Traffic and traffic, file 13, on Demonyuk. I called the staff in. I said, was there ever anybody at Treblinka, concentration camp in Poland, that was subject to a criminal trial? And bingo, they come back with Fyodor Fedorenko, a Chicago man, a Ukrainian like Demonyuk. 
He was acquitted, went to visit his family in the old country, picked up by the KGB and executed. Guarantee you our government had their fingerprints on that. Why well, submit a FOIA on Fedorenko? Trafficking, trafficking, file 13. They all knew who I was. Believe me. You get a small packet from the State Department. Two telegrams wanting information about the trial. The one telegram went out and gave the names of four people who testified. But there was a bottom of the tele telegraph, stop. Be advised there's another hundred pages in file if necessary. Stop. I called on the phone. I won't tell you the name. It was a black woman. She knew me and she liked me. I said, I don't want to get you in trouble, but this man's dead. This classified business has gone too far. I want those documents. She said, I'll give them to you, Congressman. They tried for years to get me to tell who that was. Never said it. When I got it, there were 17 people to testify. They all testified Ivan was taller than Demenyik. He didn't have blonde hair like Demenyik. He had black hair. He had a long scar on his neck, and his name was Ivan Marchenko. Now all the members of Congress, stay away from me, man. You're crazy. What a fool, man. What's wrong with you? Please, Jim, don't bring it to me. I asked for a hearing. This is too sensitive. I said, since when the sensitivity waved the Bill of Rights? That Bill of Rights should be standing by this guy's side and every man's side. Newspapers call me a fool. There was a photograph in there where one of those witnesses identified him. He said, the small man on the right with the pistol is Takchuk. The tall man on the left is the man the prisoners feared the most, Ivan Grozny, Ivan Marchenko. And it wasn't a picture of Demenyuk. I held it up. You're not allowed to on the House floor to maybe put it down. Sixth Circuit Court in Cincinnati wouldn't accept the evidence. Congress wouldn't hold a hearing. Citizenship stripped. Stripped away, convicted of mass murder on death row to be executed. To be executed, Dan. Send it over to the Israeli Supreme Court. I went over. When I got there, I was like a rock star in Israel. <laughs> Everybody knew I was. I had my own bodyguard. And I went to see him in his cell. I want you to imagine an 8 by 16. Split in half with an 8 by 8 for him and an 8 by 8 with a desk for his guard. In an 8 by 16 walkway, he was allowed one hour a day, three days a week. And he had a little patch of bare dirt out there. And he collected pigeon droppings and water. And the guards all loved him. They brought him in plants and he planted them. He made me potato soup when I was there. Willis. Potato soup. It was the best potato soup I ever had. He looked at me, because you know I'd beaten the, the, the government in Cleveland, and his eyes were like this. He said, thank you so much, Jim. He said, I am not Ivan. I said, I know you're not Ivan. When I got back, I got a call from Brian Gumbel on the Today Show. And Brian says to me, Congressman, what's happening over there? I said, listen. I've submitted some said John Demenick, 
will be delivered to me tomorrow night at Tel Aviv Airport. Take him home. Now, I was in prison the last time they took that old man to court. If they didn't put me in prison, they would have never taken him to trial. They convicted him for lying on his papers. All Ukrainians lied on their papers. If they didn't, they'd have been automatically repatriated back to Joseph Stalin, who would have put him in front of a firing line and executed him. Sad affair. And after it was all over, there was a major investigation. You know what it was, Willis? How did trafficking get this information? We had a hell of a problem. I was able to take a lot of money out of Congress, help my area. I did it by completely disrupting Congress. I once had a record 10 hours of parliamentary points of order on a Treasury postal bill that was this thick. When it went to the Senate, it went this big. I cut everything, even the vice president's expense account, which wasn't approved under permanent law. It had to be reauthorized and reappropriated every year. So they came to me, Paymon, they said, listen, if you promise not to do that, we'll build that courthouse for you. I said, OK. To make a long story short, I'm not any of the committees. I was the only member in the United States. Kennedy and Byrd called and said, how the hell did they do that? that had a full 16-plane Air Force Reserve wing in my district. I'm not on any of those committees. I destroyed a $400 billion bill over an amendment that I put in for a congressman. And maybe I'll take a minute so you understand how Congress works. I don't want to say his name, but there's a powerful politician that had a scandal in the primary was getting beat. His people called and said, they don't want Clinton, they don't want Cuomo, they don't want Gephardt. They want you. It was in Pennsylvania. I'm the old quarterback. They want you to speak at this big rally. And I went. It was a jam. And when they left there, they were marching. And he was so pleased. He said, you turn this thing around. Well, election night, he survives. He calls me. He said, anything you want. Anything. Well, I was getting anything I wanted. So I said, I want you to put a language in your appropriation bill. That any country denies American companies the right to bid on their government contracts, they can't bid on our defense contracts. It's only a defense bill, but it's $450 billion back then, bigger than all the budgets of the world except five. He said, Jim, he said, it can be knocked out on a point order. Say, you're doing that all up here. You've, you've changed everything around. I said, I know. I want you to go to Claude Pepper, the chairman of the Rules Committee. I want you to ask him for a waiver on a trafficking provision. So that I could battle it out on the House floor, they can't strike it on a point of order. You have to know the technicalities. You've got to read it, Larry. So he said, what is it? I told him what he says. Damn it, Jim. That's Rosinkowski. That's trade. I said, who the hell is Rosinkowski? Is he the speaker now? I said, you asked Claude Pepper for that waiver, Chairman. That's the agreement you made. And you let me and Rostinkowski have it out on the floor. Well, I get a call from Claude Pepper. Oh, Claude Pepper from Florida? He says, Chef, I just got a call from Chairman Rostinkowski, and he's livid. And he's coming before the committee at 6 o'clock. He says, well, I'm going to give you... The opportunity to come too. So listen to this. I go. And you could imagine this. You'd have laughed. There's this little table, about two feet deep, three feet wide, two chairs. Me and Rosinkowski, I'm to his right. We're rubbing shoulders. There's a semicircle committee, about 20 some people, not real big, right up off the House floor. And he, Chairman Pepper goes, Chairman Rosinkowski, he said, We can't have Maverick Congressman writing our trade laws. I want this committee to know, and he's looking at him. I want an open rule, a complete open rule. I don't want any waivers, because I will let you know right now, I will strike the trafficking provision under general provisions. He took about 30 seconds looking at him, and they're scared to death of him, you know. 
So I'm sitting next to him, you know. He's getting all worked up. He said, Mr. Chavagan, I said, almost word for word. I said, you know, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Rosinkowski is a powerful man. And he gets his way on everything. Why don't you screw him this time? They almost <laughs> fell out of the chair. He jumped up. Hoom, hoom, hoom. He walked out. Well, I get a call, Larry. About a half hour later, open rule, open rule. They need the money so bad now in Iraq, they bring the spending bill out before the authorizing bill. Appropriations bill you read, line by line. So the clerk shall read, Title I, Army, gentlemen from Ohio. They were coming out of the cloakroom saying, what's this jackass doing now? I said, I raise a point of order to Title I. It constitutes legislation, appropriation bill, without prior authorization. I demand it be stricken. The chairman said, Jim, what are you doing? We're at we're war, we're at war. I said, don't give me that war shit. Excuse my mouth. He has his hand over the thing. I have my hand over the thing. They said, well, the gentleman's point of order is not properly worded. Chuck will read. I said, Mr. Chairman, everything on page 9, line 7, through and including page 39, line 19, constitutes legislation without prior authorization. Go by the rules. Watch this, folks. Gentlemen's point of order is sustained. Army's gone. Senate's going to write the bill. Title II, Air Force, gentleman from Ohio, gone. Title III, Navy, gentleman from Ohio. He reaches over and says, look, Rosinkowski called. He said, if you yield back to strikes, he'll let your stuff go through. I said, don't give me that now. Glenn and Metzenbaum ain't going to stand up for this in the Senate. They're scared to death of this trade business. He said, I'm giving you my word. It'll be in that bill, Jim. I said, you know, Chairman, I have C-130B boxcars, old flying boxcars at my base, eight of them. They're going to close, you know. I'll lose about 2,500 jobs. I said, but I notice you're building 12 C-130 Hercules brand new aircraft, about 200 million apiece. I said, you give me eight new ones this year and eight new ones next year for a full wing, and I'll yield back that strike. I can't tell you the exact words. But he said, you've gone too far. I said, Mr. Chairman, I demand in my point of order. He said, hold it. I want you to watch this now. I'm going to give you the planes. You've got to get the White House to sign off. There's not a 16-plane wing in the world. And I'm going to give you the language, but you've got to promise never to track my bill again. I said, okay. Watch this now, Larry. I ask unanimous consent my pending strike, Title III, be vacated. Title III be passed over without prejudice, without objection, so ordered. Navy is fully funded. There wasn't a bit of debate. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent here to force sustain strikes one and two. Be rescinded and passed over without prejudice, without objection, so ordered. Fully funded. Murtha stood up, Chairman. He said, I ask unanimous consent remain that the bill be considered as read. Without objection, so ordered. Any amendments? None. Move the question. $450 billion defense bill wasn't a bit of debate on it. There was a 16-plane wing established in Youngstown, Ohio. And any country that denied our companies, they couldn't bid on our defense contracts. They did not like me. Now, this is why I'm here. How much time do I have, Paymon? Two of my last bills, and they would have been law. It was probably my big mouth and my one-minute speeches that kept the heat on the Randy Weaver case that finally got him into a grand jury with that shooter and acquitted. I made a speech once a week. My bill was the Fair Justice Act. And Chairman Hyde from Illinois called me and said, Jim, I'm going to hold a hearing on it. Here's what the Fair Justice Act was. The FBI, the Treasury, the Justice, they commit a crime and they investigate themselves. 
The trafficking bill says that there will be a new agency called the Fair Justice Agency. The president shall nominate, Senate confirm for a 10-year term, director of the Fair Justice Agency with two tasks, investigate and prosecute crimes committed by individuals within the justice and IRS. It goes to a hearing, and it's probably the only hearing in the history of the United States Congress. They were all there. And they said in the paper that a fight broke out. I won't admit to that. But the Capitol, the Capitol Police had to be called in. And they postponed the hearing. And I never got another chance to really get at them. They did what they had to do because they knew. They knew it was just a matter of time. But the big one was in concert with two Republicans. Some people call it a tax bill. It is not a tax bill. It is appropriate here to discuss it. It is a freedom bill. I want you to listen carefully. And I've been to the events. And after the event's over, we take pride in hearing Larry and Dan and Russell and Joe. And then we leave and we have good memories and nothing happens. We have no program. We've lost the country, and it's going to get worse. Now I hear everybody up here talking different politics. I want to say one thing while I'm here. I know how they do things down there, and I know what they're doing, how they're doing, what they're thinking before they do it. For example, they did not want Barack. They wanted Hillary. They kept Gore out. They kept Kerry out. They jackpotted Edwards in two months and said there's no way this black guy with a Muslim name from Chicago is going to beat our girl. They didn't want Barack Obama. And I'll say one thing for him now, and I want to give credit to Mr. Cardo and American Free Press. He has kept us out of war. And if you had had Clinton... Or Romney, your sons and daughters be coming back in body bags right now. Now I want to say this, because this gets very controversial. They wanted George Bush to initiate war with Iran so that when Hillary come in, she wouldn't have the burden of the war. She could say, I inherited it, and I'm prosecuting it. They could fool these people. Can't fool me. When they realized they may not be able to beat Barack Obama, the Clintons took them to APAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee. And they're so powerful, they damn near control Congress. In 19, late 80s, early 90s, they fired a top ranking woman, and she gave a whistleblower count of their political activity. And the top political target in the world was Jim Trafficking of Youngstown, Ohio. As a result, with the Demenia case, I've been labeled an anti-Semite, and I certainly am not. But I will tell it like it is. Israel's gotten so much power, they have started to control the election process in this country, and it's no good. Guys like me, I couldn't raise a dollar. But I looked at our country. I looked at the misery, the unfairness. We're all slaves. We've joined our black brothers from years gone by. We're slaves to a tax system. Think about everything we talked about, all these forms you've seen, everything about the IRS, what Joe Bannister was talking about. For what? Why do we have a 16th Amendment, first of all? And I'm not going to get into legality. It makes no difference if it's legal. The powers that be made it legal. 
We have the 16th Amendment because when they first come with an income tax, it was taken to the Supreme Court and it was stricken down. Unconstitutional. The founders did not want your personal industry, your labor, to ever be taxed. It was only supposed to be what? The top 1% going to be taxed. And all the little people, yeah, go get them. And every election, yeah, raise the taxes on the rich. What a joke. Those riches get more tax breaks after it's over, and you pay more taxes. Billy Tozan from Louisiana, Dan Schaefer from Colorado, two bright Republicans, and Jim Travigan offered the national retail sales tax. Everybody pays it, no exemptions. But before I get into it, and they jumped on me, I was against the poor hell I was raised in a poor area, I was poorer than anybody probably in Congress. By the way, after I won that criminal trial, they took me to a civil trial, garnished my wages, I made $2,300 a month all the years I was in Congress. My wife wasn't working, I'd qualified for food stamps. They hated me. Here's the way it works. Internal Revenue Service eliminated. The Federal Reserve is eliminated. Yes. Yes. I'm not for an audit. The audit is only going to come back and say how good they are and how necessary they are. Come on. I know how they operate. Throw them the hell out. Put the same people under control of a committee of Congress. Number three, repudiate all interest to these bankers who have robbed us for years. Don't pay it. Tell them we're not going to pay it. <laughs> the money that we do owe those bondholders that are American citizens and or those legitimate debts of foreign nations we pay. But that usurious, criminal, bank conspiracy that has corrupted this country, you're not going to get another penny. Take us to court. You repeal the 16th Amendment to make sure that thing don't come back. You put the nails in the coffin for good. Now, pimp, some people disagree with me on this, but I also say repeal the 17th Amendment. See, in the old days, the legislature from Florida would pick the two federal U.S. senators. And what better way to have states' rights than to have those senators beholden to the state? Now they don't behold this popular vote, and they're running for president. They're campaigning in California. Throw it out. Let the state senators appoint their people to make sure their senators take care of their state. This is the United States. States of America, not the central government of America. And let's get away, let's get away from that big government right now. <laughs> Department of Energy, Department of Labor, Department of Education, set standards, let the state run it. EPA, set standards, let the state run it. Get the bureaucracy out of Washington. Get the job, get them the hell out of there. Put your fiscal house in order. But now here's how the bill works. No more tax on withholding. Right now, you money's withheld. The federal government decides how to spend it. You get the entire pay. You decide how to spend it. All taxes on savings are eliminated. All inheritance taxes are eliminated. You work all your life and you've got to give 60% of it to Uncle Sam. You've got to sell it because you can't give it to your family. No more inheritance tax. It's gone. Some people say, Jim, are you serious? No more corporation tax. They pass it on to us. We need a friendly environment for companies to do business in America. No more capital gains tax. Not a penny. Jobs are created the old-fashioned way. People are going to invest. They're going to put that entrepreneurial money out there.
No more tax on Social Security, no more tax on Medicare. Jim, how are you going to do this? Don't panic. There's a flat 25% tax on all new goods and services. Now, before you panic, I get these people saying, we love it, but how come it's 25%? Why do we pay, have to pay any tax, Jim? Let's get out of dream world. We got a hell of a country. It takes money to run it. But here's why the 25%. Archer said we could leave Social Security and Medicare out, and we can go with a 17% retail tax. Folks, under this program, there's no more forms. None. No more records. None. None. Harvard did a study, and I want you to listen. When you go out and see that new car made in America, 25% of the cost of that car is they're complying with the numerous regulations and burdens of the tax code. When you remove the tax code, you take 25% cost out of that car in America. Now hear me. Because we don't only have a budget deficit, no one's talking about the killer. The trade deficit, which if they were telling us the truth, is probably three quarters of a trillion dollars a year now. Now Dan, how can you Buy more than you sell to stay in business. Richard, how could you do that? You can't. Only the government printing their money. And you know that's going to come to an end, and I think Dan and Larry both gave us pretty good ideas of that. Here's the bottom line. Let's take a look at an American car, and here's what Harvard said. With a 25% imposition of that retail sales tax, there will probably be little, if any, price increase that we have now on available goods. They said because when that car company gets that 25% reduction off it, they won't be looking. There are no more loopholes. They'll be looking for market share. Now that $20,000 car will be coming in at 17. Chrysler will say, we're going 16. Ford will say, we're going 15. They'll be going for market share, and they predict with a 25% tab put on it, there will be no appreciable in increase in cost. But there's one other thing, and I want you to think about this, Dan, because you're starting to deal with monies back and forth across the big pond. That car made in America today has a 25% weighted factor. It goes overseas, they're loading it. What are we selling over there? Nothing. Our companies have moved over there. Why do they move over? Because they don't like us? No, they move over there to make a profit. It's getting to the point they can't do it here. They're strangled with regulation. That tax code is killing us. It's subsidizing illegitimacy. Penalizes investment. Destroying families. That tax code is responsible for aimless kids on the street without families. Once everybody becomes a part of our system, they'll take pride in the system. They'll be a franchise holder in our system. They're not now. Let's look at the car. Now, with that tax, it's not sold in America, right? It's shipped overseas, no load. It's now competitive overseas. But now, for the first time in history, and none of these communists can holler protectionism, you have the first border-adjusted tax in our history, and no one can complain, folks. When that Toyota comes across the seas and it sells in America, it's going to get hit with 25%, just like that Chevy Cruze. And you know what's going to happen? They'll be building those Toyotas here. You'll see American companies coming back home. But there's one other thing, folks, and no one has looked at this. We have an underground criminal economy. No one even knows how big it is. It'll be taxed. You have visitors from Japan and Germany? They'll be paying into our Social Security. I want you to think about that. Those people from Canada come down here to shop, 
They'll be paying taxes to Uncle Sam. They're not a visitor. You're a welcome alien. I made this prediction. I said if this program is not enacted in the United States of America, our country will implode by 2030 like the Soviet Union did without a shot being fired and no advance notice. I guess Pat Buchanan's come out now and he said he predicted by 2025. How can you miss? There's one other thing about this plan. If there's a surplus, that dividend is returned back to the taxpayers per household. You get a two, three hundred billion dollar surplus, you're talking two, three thousand dollar check going to come back in the dividend. But everybody pays, every single buddy. There will still be the programs, many of them that we have, and the safeguards on the bottom. But they say, Jim, how can that welfare woman pay that 25 percent? She getting that food stamp. And that cost of bread's going to go down. Their production costs are going to go down. But let me just tell you something. And get away from that black-white business. I have a very dear friend I played football with for years. And I was talking with Mrs. Cardo about this, I think, last night. They're going on their third child, and they're a white couple, and they're not married. He said he can't afford to be married. He's working and she's raising the kids and she qualifies for all the benefits. We have a systemic problem, folks. We have a systemic problem where people are learning how to live in a subsidized, governmentally dependent society. Folks, this ain't right. This isn't right. This isn't a battle of taxes. And I tried to say this to pay more. And I am glad that the founder and a real hero, Willis Cardo, is here. And you remember the old spotlight? Listen, there's no bigger file than any NSA, or CIA, or FBI, or IRS than there is probably on Willis Cardo. He has stood up, and he stood up for issues that were very controversial. But I, I, want, I want Mr. Cardo in the American Free Press to become the catalyst of this. It took me 12 years to change the burden of proof. I'm not even in Congress. I might even be alive. Many of us may not be alive, but it'll, hap it'll happen. We've got to start. And I want the Freedom Law School, the ruminant of Freedom Law School, freedom, to be one of the players here. We got to get around the country. We got to get people. There's going to be naysayers. Oh, Christ, all that tax. Jim, why 25? We're not 22. Let this country prosper. Bring those jobs back home. Take care of that trade deficit. The budget deficit will take care of itself. We now have an engine completely out of control. These politicians don't know what the hell they're doing. They could, half of them can fall out of bed and miss the floor. <laughs> People don't believe me when I say that. I once said on the House floor, we have to incentivize our economy. The one guy said he was chairman of the committee. What's that incentivize business? So, in golf. I don't have that a podium in a house floor. I'd be scared to death if I did. This NSA business, I'd have Snowden coming back in a chariot, crowned as a champion, not indicted. Yes. 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 There are other people who should have come out. But this is what I'm talking to you about. We, we were separated from our government. And the thing that bothered me the most that I, I could never forget, and, and then you hear somebody so eloquent like Larry, he, he lays it out, he's educating, he's teaching us. 
And then I see visually an IRS witness before a congressional hearing saying, without the element of fear, we will not be able to collect our taxes. Without the element of fear. Fear! Now here's a dramatization I made for Archer. On the burden of proof. So Chairman, I want you to imagine a family of five at the dinner meeting, dinner table. And the wife just blurts out, John, John, let's call him. Let's call the accountant, John, I'm worried. Margaret, not now, not in front of the kids. John, you keep saying not now. I'm scared to death. They want 50000 Not now. Well, when, John? Damn it, I'm afraid to death. They said we owe $50,000. He said, I'm telling you, we don't owe 50000 She said, look, I took it upon myself. I called them today. He said he could talk to those people. He thinks he could settle this for fifteen, dollars maybe $20,000. He said, damn it, I'm not paying them anything. Enough is enough now. I'm afraid, John. I'm afraid. Go ahead and call him. What kind of system do we have? What kind of a system do we have where you have a guy like Joe Bannister has to actually come out and pinpoint it from within? and is then made to look almost like a criminal. Most people don't read the paper. All they know is, boy, he's some kind of a nut. So I think this is where we've got to start. Not just meeting and talking about what's wrong. What's our program? What is our program? You've got some of the best minds. I've given you a rough outline. Before it's over, there's an awful lot of things that could be done. And even though I've said a few things about Congress, they're afraid, believe me. But there are minds there, once it gets moving in the right direction, where they can take that thing and mold it, and you would see some really imp big improvements. Reduce the size of our government. Increase the size of our people. More take-home pay. Let them decide what to do with it. And if they save it, they don't pay taxes on it again. It's theirs. You will see money for commercial loan activity. You will see entrepreneurs again taking a risk. And why shouldn't they be rewarded? Because how do we create jobs? That big thing we had a couple winters ago, the big explosion of jobs was 400,000 part-time census workers. God almighty. Jobs will be created the old way. Go ahead, come on in. Where people will invest money, they will take a risk. Now, as far as Social Security and Medicare, it's all included in it, folks. Actuarial show right now, they're spending more money they're taking in. It will be preserved forever. 45 of the 50 states already collect the sales tax. They'll get a small stipend for collecting ours. Five states that don't, if we have to, we'll collect it. 95% of all retail sales taxes are earned by big, big companies and corporations. You sell a used car, no tax. You sell anything used, no tax. You have a, a garage sale, lawn sale, no tax. Bless you. Only new goods and services. 
You will see companies moving back to America. You will see a direct impact upon our trade situation. And if that's not done, forget the budget deficit. Trade deficit will kill us. And Dan talked to us about something I don't even want to get into. The world's reserve currency. If that goes, folks, I give America less than a year, it will implode. One year. And don't think that some of these foreign nations who do not like Uncle Sam aren't burning the midnight oil looking at the scenario. They have their own problems, or I think there'd be more action. But what was it that Charles de Gaulle said? He said, you never defeat America with a missile, but you destroy him through the dollar. We can buoy that dollar. We can build our economy. We can stabilize our economy. We don't need all these troops all over the world. One of my bills was take 10,000 and put them on our borders. Keep people from jumping a fence and keep drugs the hell out of here. Passed in a house against all opposition. Senate killed it. Now we have an Office of Homeland Security with open borders. Now think about it. And what does it boil down to? Both parties are trying to get a huge Hispanic bloc vote. While they're worried about maintaining their majorities, the country's going to hell in a half basket. Look, my position is real clear on a lot of these issues, and I think many Americans feel the same way. If you're in here in our country legally, you're one of us. If you're not, get the hell out. We don't want you. We're going to keep you out. These are the things we got to do. What I would like when I leave today, and I don't know, I, I've given a lot of thought in coming down here, and the reason I come down is Paymon is just the greatest. And by the way, to see you last night with your family Great. and that beautiful event, that was a beautiful scene. And congratulations. <laughs> I, have, I have a little bit of a, I brought a little painting for you, by the way. I'll have to give it to you. And I think I've gone beyond my time, but I don't know what your situation is. But listen carefully. I'll entertain your questions if it's allowed. But if you go off half-cocked, when I'm done with you, you'll be able to exit that door, closed door with a top hat on, because I'm not playing. I don't want any aggravation. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Real quick. Yes, in the back. Yeah, and stay the hell out of foreign wars. And I will give this president that credit, because we could have very well have been in a war, folks. And let's hope that they don't beat that down before it's over and put us there, because we had a few spies that were working for those ends. Yes, Mrs. Cardo. No, it's not. It's not a value added. It's final retail sales. You buy a coat, they say, well, trafficking, you're going to buy a $100 coat. Now it's going to be $125. But here's what Harvard said. That $100 coat is probably going to sell for $80 now. When you take the burden of the tax code off and take the weight off and the cost they have to meet with the burden. It's final retail sales. But let me ask you this. Everybody in this room probably pays 25% tax right now or more. You don't realize it. You know, a service charges a tax. A fee is a tax. A toll is a tax. All these fancy words, they're all taxes. And when the Supreme Court ruled Obamacare constitutional, it was a deadpan legal argument. Harry can substantiate. It has a tax. It's a tax. And Congress has the right to tax. Now let me tell you something you don't know and make you think. Because I believe Social Security is in de jeopardy. Do you realize that all these deficits they talk about, national debt, does not include Social Security and Medicare? Do you know that Social Security and Medicare is not included in the accounting of our national budgets? 
and fiscal uh, statements. And do you know why? Because Congress could change it, Congress could raise the taxes on it, or Congress could eliminate it. It's not even factored in. You know what we have, folks? You have file cabinets with a bunch of IOUs in. And someday, somebody's going to have to pay the piper. We need a revenue stream. Everybody got to pull that revenue stream. Right now, you have half of the country paying for the other half. But what's happened with that is we destroyed families with that policy. We can't do that. I believe families will stick together if they can make it as a family. But there are people that are just separating and not living together that you would never imagine. They can't make it. So how do we do it? Are they going to have another reform bill like Larry showed us with a different number and some different buzzwords? And the last one I saw was, after all the definitions, it said, but not limited to them all, to the above. In other words, what else is there? Who are they going to tax? They're an outer space thing come and pay them on? I mean, you started with that sauerkraut. Where is it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. <laughs>